Uh, up next, we have uh, Megan Licklider munden Megan is an archaeologist and museum professional with a broad range of experience in the heritage sector. Uh, during the course of her archaeological career, Megan has directed or participated in terrestrial and underwater projects in the U.S., U.K., Mediterranean, and the South Pacific. Prior to returning to graduate studies for her Ph.D., she was the director of an aviation history museum housed in a historic air terminal. She volunteers for and has served on the board of several nonprofit museum organizations and is dedicated to museum development. Her studies with the National Archaeology Program at Texas A&M University specialized in deep water and aviation archaeology, conservation studies, museum studies, and heritage preservation. Megan's current projects involve diver integrated ROV rec site survey, site mapping and photo mosaic, aluminum conservation research and experimentation, and 3D laser scanning heritage objects. Please uh, help me welcome to the stage, Megan. Hello, everyone. Uh, apologies for setting up this thing. There's still a lot of, um, a, just a couple of dates that I'm, I freeze on, so I'm gonna refer to uh, a couple of notes. Um, it's really nice to actually be giving a presentation at an aviation conference because usually I give presentations at either archaeology or science conferences and I really have to skip over a lot of the history because everybody else wants to hear about something else. So in this instance I will go over a lot of history and if anybody has any questions, I'm sure at the end, but if anybody wants to talk more about um, the technology behind it, the archaeology behind it, or the science behind it, then just make sure and, and come see me later. So, um, the, the observ uh, well, this presentation is more about the survey of one particular B-24 that went down in the Adriatic near Croatia. So, the project itself was the project itself is um, the survey that we did in 2014 was funded by the Institute of Nautical Archaeology and by Video Ray. It was very generously participated with by Video Ray. So Video Ray is a company with small, very small observation class ROVs that are able to do um, actually a lot of, of uh, very cool sites. It, it doesn't matter the current or, well, I'm sorry, it does matter the current, but nothing too crazy. And it can go um, pretty much very deep, very shallow. It's, it's very small, so it can go in anywhere that you need it to go. And it's highly maneuverable with a skilled pilot that is not myself. So on this, exp or on this survey um, was myself a gentleman from Video Ray, and then I also wanted to put up Kevin Gray from the Tulsa Aviation, or sorry, the Tulsa Air and Space Museum who did the majority of the background research for the, this particular aircraft. Um, because we are gonna go so far into history, I just wanted to start off just a tiny bit with aviation archeology, span just so that we can get it into the scope of this conference. I'm sure that you guys have heard a lot about, um, maybe not about, I missed yesterday, the, the theory behind aviation archeology, span the history of it, and for those of you who were here last year, I recognize some faces. I went into a lot of history behind aviation archaeology and <clears throat> excuse me, why it's done, the reasons um, for doing it, the way people do it, and, and what we're really hoping to get out of it. But I'll go over just a tiny little bit again. Um, the term is from 1950s, or sorry, 1940s, 50s post-war. Uh, you have a very limited era for study for high-integrity sites. You can find aircraft parts all over the place, but for very, you know, together sites, especially underwater, um, it, you're looking really in the sort of 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and until you reach the jet age and where if you're going down on water, you are going down fast. So um, the material that you get from the sites is usually recovered for museum display. That's the point. We want people to be able to see the aircraft again. In some cases, to be able to fly the aircraft again. There's something very special about 
um, aircraft and the flight of them and the noise they make. Sometimes you can't divorce that from the actual aircraft experience, and that's what you're going for in a museum. Um, but in some cases, all you can do is just display them. <clears throat> if they're very historically important, you don't want to run the risk of, of crashing them all over again or, or destroying them in any way. You lose that important artifact. So there's a, a difference between restoring something for flying condition and simply being able to understand it in a way that it is either by looking at it or um, <clears throat> experiencing it. Sorry for my coughing. Um, with archaeology, of course, archaeology is a set of standards. It, it, archaeology means that we are doing something in a way, and that way is according to a set of standards. It incorporates other sciences and the use of different technologies. So what I said last year, basically, is archaeology borrows from other areas, other disciplines, in order to help us create a story. So what we're trying to do is basically tell more of the story that you would get from a crash report, or more of the story that you would get just by looking at it. Um, basically, we want to tell as much of the story as absolutely possible, and we want that story to be as accurate as absolutely possible. <clears throat> oh, thanks. <laughs> so, in terms of um, aviation archaeology, in terms of uh, usual documentation methods, excuse me for one second, what we're seeing is um, sonar documentation where we are just going to go find these objects underwater. We see a lot of 2D site mapping where we want to describe what we're seeing. We want to, um, instead of just taking a photo, we want to absolutely highlight some parts, highlight not parts. Um, with photo mosaic and, and comparing a rec site to a plan, we're trying to make it, it, it obvious what's missing, um, how, how exactly you're looking at the rec, and, and, and ways to, diff or, sorry, to understand it differently in your brain. Uh, forensic study, we're trying to figure out <clears throat> what exactly went on <clears throat> and by laying it out exactly. And then documentation of the actual difference between what comes up and what went down. That's a very important thing for archaeology. But as you can see with all of these, and especially pictures of these, you're looking at very 2D objects. You're, you're only getting a little bit of the picture. So you can only understand it in, in that way. What if you wanted to see, like on the third one, what if you wanted to see it from the side? Um, you couldn't do that with a 2D site map. So what we're looking at, where archaeology is going, especially with aviation, is into the 3D realm. And it'll be something that's sort of pervasive throughout this entire presentation. It's a bit difficult to describe all of the cool things with 3D um, mapping on a 2D PowerPoint presentation that I can't control. So Use your imagination. <laughs> if you can um, imagine that these, so this is a P-38 that's sort of half in, half out of water um, sometimes. And this one is a Corsair that has been 3D mapped. Um, I'll get into it a little bit later, but these are the, start, uh, the sorts of efforts that are beginning to be um, uh, more well used in archaeology. This is the road that we're going down. So... <clears throat> To get into a little bit of the history, um, my project, and this will end up being for my dissertation, I am a PhD student at Texas A&M University in the Nautical Archaeology Program. Um, I chose this, liber sorry, it's a B-24 Liberator bomber. I chose this one mainly because, well, it's, to be very candid, it was very easy for me because this airplane has such a rich and well-documented history. Sometimes, and this is what I argued last year as well, is that it's not, it, not every aircraft site needs to be fully, fully, fully documented to the absolute extent of the law and um, fully conserved and never put on display. And, and, and you get a bunch of black and white with this. But this one, um, this aircraft has a very, very rich history 
And I want to go into that a little bit because it makes a difference on how we approach this survey and how we're going to approach further surveys. So at this point, actually, at this point, this is where I usually ask the audience if everybody knows what a B-17 is because in my circles not a lot of people do, but I don't need to do that. So that's very good. Go. All right. So this B-17 was um, made in the Douglas Aircraft Factory in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma had one of the aircraft factory plants, especially for B-24. Um, it was sort of a, um, a complementary factory to the Willow Run. Willow Run would produce components, send them to the Douglas Aircraft Factory to then put together. I think in this case, actually, since this one was the last B-24 produced at Douglas Aircraft Factory in Tulsa, they put together more of it. They, they put together the majority of the aircraft themselves and, and built some components for it. Um, B-24s were coming off the assembly line at one every 55 minutes during this time period. That wasn't to say that the entire B-24 was built in 55 minutes. That just means that every day, every 55 minutes, there was one being produced at um, this factory. This factory produced just under 1,000 B-24s from 1942 to 1944. Um, this B-24 was number 952. It was the last produced before the factory started to turn to A-26s, I think, and that might be wrong. Um, so number 952, being the last one, everybody knew that they were about to start to turn to produce a different aircraft. In order to, to, um, to build this aircraft, the factory workers actually agreed to purchase all of the war bonds for the funding of this aircraft by themselves. It was purchased um, by people's grandmothers who worked in the factory, the Tulsa community, and it was a very community-based project that everybody got into. Um, they held a raffle for the naming rights to the aircraft and for the nose art. They wrote this, actually, the crew, uh, sorry, the, um, the factory workers and the citizens began to just take an interest in this aircraft's well-being, and they thought of it as theirs. They named it as theirs. They, they did all of the design work from the nose art themselves. It was, it was a raffle base, so, so everybody got to put in their ideas, and that's what they held. This note was written to the crew. It says to the combat crew members of this Liberator bomber, um, this warplane is the last of hundreds built in this factory. Um, in sending the last B-24 bomber to combat, employees who helped build it, whose names are signed herein, and this was on the beginning of a very long list of names that everybody signed, um, they, felt they saw fit to build it, they saw fit to buy it, and we want you to use this and for the greater good. So basically, they were staking their claim they, they were sending this on. This note, along with, you can see it's a, it's a rolly scroll. Um, everybody's names went on that. That went into this pouch on the side, and that pouch went with the aircraft. It was put right behind the cockpit, or the um, uh, pilot seat. Um, thankfully, it was taken out before its last flight, so they still have that today. Oh, sorry. So this was put right behind um, the seat. It says, this B-24 bought and built by the employees of the Douglas Aircraft Co. And when I said ba uh, that they also got to design the nose art, this is what it would have looked like um, with color, with one minor difference I'll show you in a second. It's pretty evocative. This is what it ended up looking at like, and this is what it was ended up being named, the Tulsa American. Um, you can see this, the difference is, is that on the last one, it had a, a war axe with some blood. And on this one, it has an American flag. It had this on both sides. Um, the nose art was very, very iconic. On this, as well as signing the names onto the scroll that went around with the aircraft, people who bought war bonds, like this lady worker, 
they got to sign their names to the actual, uh, sorry, the actual fuselage. And what began as signing names turned into writing messages. And they were messages like, you know, feel the wrath of my bombs and, you know, go get them and, and hey, crew, take this airplane. And, you know, people wrote um, their addresses down. They wrote down sweet messages. Um, they wrote down, hey, my name is blah, blah, blah. Anything that they wanted to, they were able to write on the fuselage of this. It was um, high polished aluminum. There was no other other color. Um, and you can see them. Just I, I can see them. I hope that you can see them back in the um, right here, uh, right here. There's a bunch right here, and then this is that sign with everybody's name on it. The the, the entire aircraft was covered with these signatures. And what began to happen was that as the aircraft then went to be fitted, um, it went to have all of the um, guns and everything put on it. It went to go for maintenance everywhere. On its stop, it was um, ferried across to Europe. On these stops, the, the crew members, the, the people who came in contact, they started to see these messages. They started to write back to the factory workers and go, Hey, I'm in, um, you know, Wisconsin or whatever is on the way. I'm in a state that is on the way in between Oklahoma and Europe, and I saw your aircraft, and this is what I did to it, and this is how it's going, and you know, thanks very much for your help in the war effort. You know, anything that they they wanted to say, they wrote back to these people, and. Um, just everybody was able to keep up to date of what their aircraft was doing because it was their aircraft. So she was ferried to Europe and assigned to the 15th Army Air Force, 49th Bombardment Wing, 461st Bomb Group, 765th Bomb Squadron. This was at Toretta Field in Italy, um, September 1944. So she got there. Um, September 1944. She started running bomb missions. She flew 18 bomb missions over France, Italy, Austria, Germany, Yugoslavia, Hungary, and Poland. Uh, on December, whoops, I think I'm, yeah, sorry, I'm ahead one. On December 17th, 1944, the 15th Army Air Force launched a strategic bombing assault on the oil refineries in, at, in Poland. Um, Tulsa American flew along with a part Tulsa crew and along with 527 other B-24s and B-17s. Now, what happened was, unfortunately, is that when they came out of, of the cloud cover in formation, they were being waited for. There were, there were a bunch of German fighters there who immediately um, engaged them and started shooting down other members of the, of the attack team. She immediately got shot. Um, she immediately lost her, one of, oh, sh sorry, this is where I start skipping up. She immediately lost one of her um, engines. She lost her hydraulic system, and she took a hit in the fuel tank. She wasn't able to drop her bombs over the strategic target. However, she was able to drop, circle back, um, sustain even more damage from flak batteries, and she was limping home, actually. She was trying to make it to Italy. They lost another engine en route, and they decided, actually, that what they would do is that instead of making it to Italy, they would try for an emergency airstrip that was used by Allied fight or bombers, fighters, anybody, that was in Croatia. So Croatia is um, just on the opposite side of the, of the Adriatic to Italy. They were going to just try and not make that, that last little jump. Um, so she was down to two engines. She was not, the, the bomb doors were open, she was not uh, getting landing gear down. They were able to see the, the airstrip and they were able to make one circle pass. So they thought that they were all right, they thought they had some time. They took another circle pass in order to be able to get down the landing gear. So somebody was pumping down the landing gear. Um, unfortunately, that's when she lost both of her, her remaining engines. She was running about, uh, 
I think it was more like 100 meters. I have 30 meters, but I don't think that that's right. She was pretty far up above the water, and she was going at about 150 miles per hour. So when one of the two, the two remaining engines, the one that, that stopped last was on the um, left-hand side, so she went down at an angle into the water and hit the water wing first. Because the bomb bay doors were open, and actually this is something that happens with a lot of B-24s, um, especially in this area uh, coming down with, with this airfield, is that when she hit the water, she broke up completely at the bomb bay doors. And the tail section went off in a very neat piece, and the front section, the bomb bay part, was completely obliterated and the cockpit was almost completely obliterated, and that actually went down, um, I have a picture of it, that actually went down in an inverted um, uh, manner and, and sank to the bottom, it's on the bottom inverted. So, as a result, uh, everybody from the tail section survived, everybody but three of the, um, uh, excuse me, uh, the front part, yeah, anyways, Everybody but three of the cockpit area crew members survived. So unfortunately, three people died in this accident and still remain with the aircraft today. So this is a war grave. Before we get into the way that the site looks like, I just want to bring it back to the Tulsa community. Um, the community was devastated by this loss, and especially the factory workers. This was their airplane. What, one of the things that happened was that I told you it was a part Tulsa crew. One of the crew members um, who was able to survive, he had a, actually, a, he broke his leg clean in half. He was sent home. But one of the things that he did when he was sent home was that he went to the Tulsa aircraft factory and they set aside some time during their factory hours so that everybody in the factory could come and hear his account of the accident. They wanted to, to hear what happened with, with their airplane from the source, and they wanted to commiserate. They wanted to ask him questions. Um, it says, one of my favorite sentences in here is, uh, oh, I'm missing it. Maybe it's not in here. But it, it, they, they wrote something that was, uh, come, come here about, how this went down and and how we can get revenge for it, and so it was a very it was a very emotional connection that they had with this aircraft. It was still theirs. So, in terms of survey, um, the general location for the aircraft was known because the survivors of were of course rescued very near to where they went down. They were within sight of land. It's very near to this island and also the smaller islands. Um, the general location was known, but its final resting place was found in 2010. And this is due to the efforts of Kevin Gray, who I mentioned earlier. The Tulsa Air and Space Museum, excuse me, had a very fortunate volunteer in Mr. Kevin Gray, who just started researching the story, started to get into it, and then just started to really care about what had happened to this, um, to this aircraft. So he started to contact Croatian divers who were already interested in, in aviation and historical sites, and they began looking for it. And they were able to find it in 2010. This is a technical dive team because it is located at about 130 and 170 feet. It's, it's past the range of, of normal, um, just recreational diving, but not impossible. One of the things that they were able to do was positively identify the aircraft, not just based on where it went down and the local histories, but basically because there, was, there are around 15 B-24s um, around this island. Like I said, this was a very well-known airfield. A lot of B-24s got into trouble, had to come back here, and a lot of them didn't, just didn't make it. Um, so there are 15 B-24s at least around this island. It could be any one of those. What they were able to do was work with Mr. Gray and the Tulsa Air and Space Museum to identify the areas um, based on, on the, um, the deterioration of this aircraft and, and what areas were still present. They were able to find out where they might look for a data plate. Um, they were able to find that data plate and recover it from the aircraft. And actually, they were able to see 
on that data plate the serial number for the aircraft even before they did the cleaning and conservation for it. So they knew absolutely that this is, this is what they had found. They had found not only the Tulsa American itself, but the final resting place of those three crew members that didn't make it. So the wreck site itself is spread over a large area in a few large chunks. Um, the center section rests inverted right here with one landing gear sticking up. The cockpit section would have been right here. It is not right there anymore. Um, the center section is around 130 feet. This is on a ridge. The nose turret, which is this section right here, is pretty much intact, but a very long ways away, and it's right before this um, tall ridge. It's about 40 um, feet. The tail section is upright, but crushed, and you'll see pictures of it later on. One of the propellers that came off, and you'll see that it only has um, one propeller up there. The other engines are somewhere. I'd like to find those. But one propeller is, is resting against this rock, along with a couple of pairs of shoes from the tail section crew members. These are not the shoes from the cockpit crew members. Um, somebody has taken them out of the wreck and placed them near the propeller. I don't know when that happened, but that's what happened. And then the vertical stabilizers are the other uh, iconic pieces. There are ones right here and ones right here. A couple of fuel tanks, or sorry, oxygen um, cylinders are out and around the wreck, and those are the only pretty recognizable things that, that you can see. The wreck itself looks pretty good as far as decomposition goes. Um, it's not the best aluminum that I've ever seen underwater. It's got a lot of growth on it, but as you can see, it's not very silted. Um, the site itself is pretty good for visibility, but as you can see from these pictures, I mean, it's a little, it's a little hazy. This, unfortunately, is, is, this is the best one I have of the layout. Um, it's really difficult, and this is sort of the theme of the rest of the presentation. It's really difficult to get an accurate image of an aircraft this large just by diving it. And I can sit up here and show you pictures all day long of this airplane and, and how it is underwater and what it looks like from varying depths and, and varying angles. Um, I can also show you a video, but it still, it doesn't give you a really, really, really good idea of what it looks like up close or, or what this particular part, like, like this part, what? sorry, that part right there, what does that look like on the inside? And you just, you just can't see it. So in, in a, um, I'll go on on that in a minute. No, this is the tail section. Like I said, you can see that it is upright, but there's the line where it is crushed. Um, some debris is out here. One of the vertical stabilizers would be down here. The other one is up there. Um, it broke off right at the beginning of the Bombay section. All right, and so what I was saying before is that the point of the survey really was to get enough um, to get enough of an idea about whether a larger survey was even viable, about whether or not we could do what we wanted to do, which was build a complete 3D model of this site. And the reason why we wanted to do that was because I just showed you a bunch of pictures of an aircraft that is completely torn apart. The aircraft itself is important, but it, it can't be fully recovered. It would be far too expensive it'd be far too time consuming, um, and you wouldn't get a product that you would then, that would be worth it. All you would be would be to get something where basically you would have to rebuild it, um, you know, 90, 95%. And we're not talking really about the soul of the aircraft anymore. We're talking about a brand new aircraft with a couple of old parts. And for something like this, where the aircraft's importance is its history, not the fact that it was this particular type of airplane. That's really important. Um, so with working with the Tulsa Air and Space Museum, what I was more interested in was trying to create a way for museum visitors, um, people's grandchildren who knew their factory workers had built something like this, something that they could understand and see and, and, and learn about without actually ever having to dive there because most people would never go and dive here. 
Um, this survey, like I said, was a preliminary survey. The, the longer survey will be this year, this summer. Um, we went out for three days in September 2014 with an eight-person team. We did two scuba dives on the upper portion of the wreck, the shallower portion, and then about six ROV dives on it. 130 feet, 170 feet. There was no way that I was going down 170 feet <laughs> and coming back. So we chose to use an ROV basically because we had limitations. We had limitations with time. I needed to get a whole lot of video and a whole lot of images. And for diving to 130 feet, we had six minutes on each dive. And there was no way that I could get, um, what I ended up getting was 1,600 images that were good and usable. There was no way that I could get that many in six minutes two times. Um, ROVs are able to, of course, have unlimited time down. They're able to be maneuvered. They're able, if they make a mistake, they can go back and get it. We can just, we can do it till we have what we need. And that's, that's what I needed to have. Um, the safety acts, uh, uh, sorry, aspect was also very important for us too. And the fact that we didn't want to disturb anything. Like I said before, the upper portion of this wreck is a war grave. We wanted to do a non-disturbance survey and just basically have a really good look at things without bumping into things or, or you know, kicking up a lot of stuff, um, getting into trouble. So the ROV system that we used was a Pro 4. This is a video ray. Like I said, it's a very small ROV. It's probably about this big, probably this big. Um, what we did, and actually I'm still surprised that they let me do it, was they let me um, stick a GoPro on top of it. Sorry, I'll, I'll continue on in a second with that. But uh, this is probably the slide that I should have had two slides earlier. We wanted to record enough of the site to inform a more comprehensive plan, and we also wanted to explore the, the methodology that goes along with, with taking images for th building 3D models, and I'll get more into that. However, we basically took an, um, a video ray, and I'm still surprised that he let me do this, but he let me drill holes into the top of it and stick on my GoPro onto it, which was fantastic. That was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, they were more than accommodating. We stuck that GoPro on there, and that had a, a movable base onto it. So basically, we, we put down the, the ROV. We recorded everything that we needed to do on a, on a setting that takes about two pictures every second. And then we brought it up, we moved the base, and then we went down for more. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, we ran the images through a software program that will build a 3D model. And what I was just talking about earlier, um, for Acquiring images that are good enough to use for 3D, if you can imagine, and this picture helps, um, every blue square there is a picture that I took. Every line that you see coming off of the blue square like this is the angle from which I took it. And what Agisoft Photoscan does is that it puts all of these into place, basically, and you can see absolutely see that, oh, I, well, and if it had a, like, if it had a bunch over, over here, I knew that I didn't take any pictures over there, so I knew something would be wrong. Um, but basically, the model itself is underneath here. You can't really see it because there are so many pictures, and um, they're all aligned to give you information about what you're looking at. So when we were moving the camera on the ROV, Basically, if you would imagine that if I was trying to take a 3D model of this microphone, I would put a camera on it here, and we would move all around it, but you would still see that if the camera got down here, I would be pointing this way. I wouldn't get the information of it up. So if we move the camera over to the side and got more information about what the microphone looked like from this side, still maneuvering around it, and then moved it and got the, the more information about what it looked from that side and the bottom, we would have enough information to build a 3D model. And this is basically what we did with this um, ROV. So this is a, a track. Obviously, you can tell that I am a, a very calm diver, and I never move around while, while you know, having the camera in my hands. <laughs> 
So the ROV, we wanted to do a very small section as a test. We chose the engine with the propeller. The ROV would approach the engine at a very specific fly pattern and make sure that it came from the bottom and, and went up until it got everything that it needed. And we flew this pattern around the engine and from the back and from the sides, we flew it, I don't know, 30 times or, or however long it took for us to get those images. And then I compiled all of those images um, and, and you know, threw out the ones that were blurry and basically put it through the software and it was able to turn back this model, which is a very dense, or, sorry, a very sparse point cloud. What you're looking at is a point cloud of data um, where it has been able to, to put together the information. It builds a sparse point cloud purely out of complete or accurate data. What you then do is you build a dense point cloud on top of that and then adjust it for your texture so that you're getting something that is, that is more accurate than this, which still looks like, you know, you know exactly what you're looking at there. Um, but it builds a 3D model of this particular part. It's pretty cool. So I had to cut this model pretty close on both sides. I, I had much more of it than this, um, but it was getting far too big for my computer's power. <laughs> so as you can see, you can go maybe a little bit too close, um, but you can really see into the, the nitty gritties of what you're looking at. This is a model that was put together specifically on that pattern. So what we also did in the survey was um, flew the, the deeper section with only the ROV just to try and see what the difference was when we just, just flew it, just didn't even care, just flew a section, and when we actually flew it to try and get these images. So this one, you can see a difference between this one and the one I showed earlier, which is um, all of these lines are, are, and everything and, and these blue pictures are all focusing around this part and I actually, I don't have any information around this part. And you can see because it's a, there's a hole here and um, a couple of holes here because we didn't fly an accurate enough path around the, the, the back side of this piece, which is one of the vertical stabilizers. But even still, um, you can see that it was able to build something. And what it was able to build was still pretty good, enough so that you can get that information about the interior, sorry for the to the um, speed of this one. We'll look at it again. You can get the, the information about the, um, the interior there and also the, in, uh, the information about the curves. Go. About the curve of the top, um, there's a piece that's broken. So this piece was absolutely broken in half and wrenched apart. You can see that better than you can in any photograph. You can see one of the um, oxygen tanks over there, a bit of debris over here. Oh, okay. Anyways, so this is the engine model again, and I'm just trying to highlight the, the good things about having a 3D model. So basically, you can look at the thing, you can get closer to it if you want to. You can manipulate, and this is just me playing around on the computer, you can manipulate it in a way that you want to, to figure out all of the information that you need. So say you wanted to, to really get in there and see what was you know, underneath the propeller. That's, it's cutting through the propeller right now and you're looking at the engine. So you can still get that and you're not taking a photograph. And then the other good part about this program is that it's the ability to then see this and then Compare it with an actual photograph of the site, and it still looks, I mean, it's, it still looks pretty good. Go. So, um, what are the, the issues and concerns? Of course, there are issues and concerns of building these models um, and, and doing the survey this way. So, the GoPro Hero, which is what I used, which is, um, you know, a, a layperson's camera. I didn't have fancy camera equipment. I didn't have the money to rent fancy camera equipment. And also, 
the reason why, one of the reasons why I chose it is because um, if I get images from my GoPro and I stick them through the program and I built that, that means that I can get images from your GoPro or your GoPro and stick them in there and build something that will tell me if I took this last year in September, if you take a video and send it to me, um, you know, two years from now, I can see what disturbances are going on and I can see, um, you know, just generally what's happening with it without either of us having to be professionals, uh, professional camera people, have really expensive equipment. Um, although, the GoPro does have some barrel distortion, and that is a bit of a red flag to me in terms of archaeology. Going back to what we said, it needs to be fully accurate. Um, we need to, oh, sorry, I need to, I need to have some sort of way to understand what the GoPro is doing with my data in order for me to say, okay, this is a passable accuracy level of data, or this is just crap and I need to throw it out. So um, those are one of my concerns with using a GoPro. Next year, we're gonna actually try, so we have one GoPro up here. We're gonna try and build like a Medusa, you know, ROV, where we have GoPros sticking out all of the sides, so that basically we don't have to bring it up and, and turn those cameras. We can just set it down with the cameras pointing all which ways, and they get all of that imagery at the same time. So I can then pick and choose what images I want to build that 3D model. Um, we're gonna use some diver laid alignment uh, targets. Basically, they help PhotoScan recognize where it should be putting things, um, and that'll be fairly easy. And then the methodology, we had almost 50% blurry photos because of the way that the ROV um, sort of goes in bursts and it bursts itself towards the, the object and then it slows down. Excuse me. So knowing this now, when we do the survey next time, it'll fly in more of a, a stop and wait pattern. So it'll be able to, to fly a little bit, stop a little bit, make sure you get the photos, fly a little bit, stop a little bit, but more pausing so that we get more good images. And then what's, what's the point? So I said in the beginning that this particular aircraft had um, a really rich history. It can never be brought up. Um, and, and actually, that's something that I'll mention right at the end. But to be able to have people understand the site still, I don't want to just show them a bunch of images. Uh, it'll, it'll help nobody. You'll get bored with it. But if we were able to offer museum visitors with the ability to um, load this app on their iPad or an iPad that they get through the museum, take it around, and then when you're confronted with an actual aircraft, be able to go, oh, I have this site map on here. I'm just going to look around. And you want to go up to um, the engine, and you want to oh my gosh, I see an engine right in front of me. I want to look at how this differs on this thing, and you move it yourself. So you move over here, and you move that, and you move over here, and you can move that. And it just gives you more of an ability to understand the differences in what you're looking at than, than just looking at a 2D picture. Um, along with that, we do want to do a traditional 2D site map because the site is so widespread. But in terms of the 3D site ma map, excuse me, it'll be the entire site as opposed to just one engine or just one vertical stabilizer. So um, that's what this year's survey is concentrating on. And um, also, just as an aside, I said that the entire aircraft can't be brought up. That is true. However, bits and pieces of this aircraft are potentially able to be brought up and those could undergo conservation and be displayed in the museum. Um, that's what we're working on getting permission for. So say the propeller that was in the deep site up against the rock, if you had that, um, you brought it up, you could basically document its entire life and then have it sitting there having undergone conservation and also be able to show visitors exactly what it looked like down there. So you get more of, of an, an immersive, <laughs> immersive experience um, looking at that propeller and um, hopefully would be able to, to connect with the exhibit more, to understand it better. 
So uh, that is all I have. That is my project. And I think that we're going out again in August of this year to, to do the larger survey, again with a video array, more cameras, um, and, and more knowledge than we had last time. So thanks very much.